Welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. We're talking today about same-sex marriage. The Supreme Court says it's the law of the land. What does that mean for couples, for states? What about religious business owners or conservative institutions? We'll find out right now. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. Our mission includes journalists around the U.S. and around the world. Three. Welcome back. I'm Linda Topping Streitfeld, Director of Training and Content at the National Press Foundation. Joining me in the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios, Sarah Warbelow. She's legal director at the Human Rights Campaign and teaches courses on civil rights law and public policy at George Mason Law School and George Washington University. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. And we have Josh Stoffregan, director of global communications at Prudential Financial. Josh is a former journalist and the project lead for Prudential's work analyzing the financial landscape for LGBT Americans. Good to have you, Josh. Happy to be here today. Great. If you're watching live, we want to take your questions. You can type them into the chat window under the webinar screen, log in, or just sign in as a guest. So we'll get started. Sarah, the first question goes to you. There are a lot of specifics to talk about, but first things first, can you just describe the case heard by the Supreme Court, Obergefell v. Hodges, was actually four combined cases. Can you talk about that? That's right. So the cases that went up before the Supreme Court in Obergefell versus Hodges were from the four states in the Sixth Circuit, Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And plaintiffs from each of those states had their claims represented before the court. But it really boiled down to two key issues. Do states have to issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples? And do they have to recognize marriages that were performed in other states and other countries? Uh, and the Obergefell um, decision came down. Uh, Justice Kennedy was the primary author. And five justices clearly said, yes, states must issue marriage licenses to same-sex couples and recognize those marriages. So this was a win for you on all counts. A tremendous win. Can you talk just a little bit about the specific circumstances of the Obergefell case? That was a kind of a tragic mm -hmm. story. Yeah, you know, many of the couples who were before the court were seeking to get married, but Jim's case was unique. Um, Jim and his husband, John, were unable to get a marriage license in Ohio, and John became very ill with ALS. They flew to a tarmac in Maryland in order to get married, and when they came back to the state of Ohio, um, Jim and John found out that Jim wouldn't be listed as John's spouse on the death certificate. And one of the promises that Jim made to John was that he would fight that decision uh, to ensure that their marriage was legally recognized. So now, will that marriage be recognized given that John passed away, right, mm -hmm. uh, before the Supreme Court made its ruling? Because Jim was the subject of the lawsuit, um, the lo death certificate will list him as the spouse. And for all purposes, um, from the date of their marriage moving forward, uh, the state of Ohio does have to recognize that marriage. Okay. Before the decision, Ohio was one of 14 states that didn't issue, either didn't issue licenses or didn't recognize marriages from other states. Now the Supreme Court has ruled so has all of that opposition just melted away? Can you get married and be recognized in any state instantly? It's a little bit of a process, but every state is issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples as we speak. Not every county is doing it. Um, there are some who are waiting for additional guidance, although it's completely unnecessary. They have everything they need to be able to issue those marriage licenses. Okay. Before this decision, there was a lot of controversy, very well publicized in some cases, from businesses who did not want to provide services for same-sex weddings, bakers and florists, et cetera. Will they now be required 
to do that? Mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court didn't address the issue of non-discrimination laws um, for sexual orientation or gender identity. That means only in the states that have adopted non-discrimination uh, for public services uh, are same-sex couples going to have um, the opportunity to address that form of discrimination. But in the vast majority of states in this country, um, including virtually all of the states of those 14, um, couples don't have that remedy. Uh, that type of discrimination is actually not illegal. Mm -hmm. So there's more work to be done. Quite a bit more work to be done. And if you are a journalist in one of those states or who's interested in following this issue, in addition to your organization, are there other resources that you can recommend for journalists, places they might go for information, statistics, uh, opinions? Um, yes, the EEOC has been tracking a lot of employment discrimination cases and has attempted to address some of the discrimination that's going on um, for LGBT people. Mm -hmm. They keep uh, an exceptional amount of data and really are a great resource for finding out more about that issue. Okay, EEOC, great resource. Longer term, there are some institutions that I'm thinking about, churches, religious schools who have been who are very worried now about this ruling because they are concerned about how it will affect their hiring ability uh, requirements for them to provide benefits for employees can you talk about that a little bit there's been a lot of misinformation out there um, churches and pastors have said that they fear losing their tax exempt status and that's all untrue um, if you are a church you can preach whatever your faith is. It's part of the First Amendment. We have very clear laws on that in this country and nobody's trying to change it. Similar arguments were made after Congress passed the Hate Crimes Act um, that prohibited um, hate crimes and, and provided remedies for people who found themselves to be the victims of violent crimes. Um, pastors said, if we speak out against LGBT people, I'm really concerned that that's going to mean um, I'm going to lose my tax exempt status. And it didn't happen in that situation. Um, it's not going to happen in this situation either. If we're talking about schools, things become a little more complicated. It depends on um, whether the school is 100 uh, percent private, does not accept any government funds whatsoever, um, and whether they are only teaching uh, to students of, of their faith. If they are schools that are really open to everybody, um, public accommodation laws may apply to them. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of a mixed bag. Yes. Okay. Josh, turning to you, let's talk about some of the financial aspects of this decision. Prudential is very involved in retirement planning. Um, at this point, what effect will this ruling have on retirement rights for LGBT couples? Right. Um, so, so the thing that we're looking at after this ruling is we're kind of looking at it in four different buckets and four different things that LGBT Americans need to think or look about, look look at in this post-marriage environment. The first being taxes, the second bucket being workplace-based retirement plans, the third being social security, and the fourth health care. So I think those four together are unique in of themselves. But when we first started looking at this community, our community, about the different unique financial challenges, how we were saving, planning, preparing for retirement uh, back in 2012, 2013, ahead of DOMA, and then after um, d Section 3 of DOMA was overturned, we found that the LGBT community is most concerned about retirement planning along with most of the, the country, correct? Right. Uh, except we have unique financial challenges and concerns, a lot of which have kind of gone away uh, with this new marriage decision, kind of leveled the playing field, so to speak. But Americans still are not understanding what exactly that means for them and for their individual households and finances. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, does it matter in terms of... Um, looking at retirement rights. Let's say I work for a company and I have a pension and I want to make sure that my spouse is going to be able to be a beneficiary. Um, does it matter how long I've been married? What are the factors to consider? Well, essentially after this decision now, 
defined contribution plans will recognize your same-sex spouse as the beneficiary on that. So that's really exciting and something new. So, so by defined contribution, you're talking about the 401k correct. plan, 50C3. Yes. What? Yes, correct. Sorry, not 50C3. 403b. Right. Correct. 400 series. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, for example, we were um, out last week in New York at the Garden Party, which was kicking off Pride in New York City, and just asking individuals, kind of man on the street, if you will, uh, about you know how they were excited about the potential decision coming down, but then asking them specifically what this would mean for their individual finances. And I think that it boils down to there needs to be a lot of education around what we're doing today, around how the journalists are covering this story, et cetera, because there's a real need for that knowledge, both in the in our community and the journalists covering it absolutely sarah what what happens if someone goes to their employer and says okay now this decision has come down and here's my spouse and i want to make sure that uh, they can have for example health benefits um <clears throat> and the company says no hr director says sorry we're we're not doing that what what's their recourse what should they do um, they should file a complaint with the eeoc and reach out to attorneys who specialize in this field. Um, the laws vary uh, a bit from state to state, but there is still plenty of recourse, and the EEOC is very interested in these claims. They actually um, settled a complaint against a major corporation just a few months ago when that corporation denied a legally married same-sex couple uh, ability to have health uh, benefits. So um, things are changing and there's lots of opportunities to ensure that employers are doing the right thing. All right, so again, EEOC, <laughs> terrific resource. Now what about Social Security? This is, as we all know, for most people, their main source of income and retirement. How does this decision affect how, what you should do about Social Security? E either of you can tackle that. Well, I think up until Friday, there was a patchwork, if you will, of, of how individuals were planning their finances if they, based on whether they lived in a state, that rec a state of celebration, a state that recognized marriage, or a state that did not, and how they would, might be able to file um, federally versus fe file in their state. And again, now, um, essentially, with the ruling on Friday, the remaining states that did not allow this benefit, it's now sweeping across the nation, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. And couples who are already legally married don't need to get married again. But for those couples who had not gotten married, if you want to have access to Social Security, um, it's imperative that you do marry. And in fact, Social Security is one of the benefits that is determined based on the length of your marriage. Um, if you haven't been married for a certain number of years and you separate, you will not have access to those benefits. Um, so if people are hemming and hawing about when their wedding date might be, um, <laughs> it's something to take into account. Head to the, <laughs> head to the courthouse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, and does it matter, um, does it depend on what type of benefit you're seeking? Is the length of time different, like for survivor benefits as opposed to a spousal? Uh, yes. Um, for uh, survivor benefits, those kick in so long as you are married. Um, but if you are talking about retirement benefits, um, and unfortunately, you know, there's been a divorce, um, if you haven't been married for at least 10 years, you will not have access to your spouse's Social Security benefits. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Social Security, a little bit of a more complicated um, issue. Is this also true? What about veterans' uh, benefits, retirement benefits? Um, it, what about those? Um, veterans' benefits were much like Social Security, a, a patchwork. Uh -huh. um, the Veterans Administration was only recognizing marriages um, that were in the state that you lived in. So even if you had gotten married in, say, Massachusetts, uh, but moved to Mississippi, the Veterans Administration was not recognizing your marriage for those benefits. Post Obergefell, they will be recognizing um, those marriages. And veterans benefits include everything from retirement um, to health insurance to the ability to be buried by um, your spouse's side in a, a veteran cemetery. So this is really a far, far-reaching uh, decision for some veterans. Yes, it's a very significant program. Okay, um, Josh, can you talk a little bit about estate planning? How does this decision change the way you would 
plan your estate uh, if you were a gay couple? Well, I think historically you would you would take into account having to pay the taxes and not being able to receive the marriage credit I in that process. And now after Friday's decision, obviously that kind of changes things. So I think that c couples, individuals need to start looking at a post-marriage equality landscape and see how they might adjust or if they should adjust. I think that uh, it is a unique situation. I was talking with someone last week who had the um, additional life insurance in place ahead of, of the to, to combat taxes, mm -hmm. and then after the decision, their financial advisor said, no, no, you should, you should keep it. So again, I think it's an individual decision, and I think for those of us who are even in this every day, we don't completely understand everything that's going on. So I think that it's important to not only consult your financial advisor, but consult a large swath or team of, of people to help you navigate these waters. Uh-huh, so just for those of us who aren't really in this um, space very often, if you are married and you die, your spouse can inherit whatever you had together. I, up, I'm, sure, I'm sure there are higher amounts that would be taxed, the, the death tax. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they can inherit without paying tax. Correct. But if you're not married or if your state didn't recognize your marriage, then you would have to pay tax on that inheritance. And now you're saying that's, that's fixed. Yes, correct. Essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, good news then. Um, what about other taxes? What about income taxes? Is there any I impact, either of you know, on income taxes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, if you are married, you get taxed differently than if you are unmarried. For some people, that's a benefit. Um, for some people, it's a bit of a penalty. Uh, and it's really important to consult um, either with a, a tax attorney um, or there's some great tax software out there to really make an assessment of how you should be filing. Um, there are multiple options, and so it's great to really explore um, how each of those options will affect your bottom line. Okay, so bottom line is it can go either way, yeah. depending on your two incomes and so forth. You don't want to get married and bump yourself into a higher tax bracket by filing jointly or well, you might anyway. There's still benefits <laughs> to being married, right, including Social right. Security. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean not get married, but maybe you can so you can be married, but you can still file that's right. separately. And, <laughs> but that's why you need a tax advisor. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> terrific. Um, big question for couples, for parents: How does this decision affect parental rights, adoption rights, all the things that go along with with being a parent? Mm -hmm. The, one of the boons to this decision is to the children of same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it's one of the things that Justice Kennedy really um, has focused on, not only in this decision, but in prior decisions. Because marriage is a really, um, offers a lot of security to, to children. Mm -hmm. But because same-sex couples are not both the biological parent of the child in most instances, um, it's important that the non-biological parent avail themselves um, of a legal relationship, either through adoption or a court order of parentage. Um, what is available varies a little bit from state to state, but there's always a mechanism by which both parents can now become the legal parent of a child. And, and we've seen some of that in the research that we've done at Prudential around confidence and how confidence in the home creates better outcomes. And we found that, uh, and this is pre-decision of Friday, but we found that uh, couples or individuals who had children, their confidence was much lower in their finances, their ability to achieve their retirement dream, day one, et cetera, because of all the different um, legal hurdles and hoops they had to jump through before Friday. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So, so now that parental rights will be more insured, people will have more confidence in other areas of their financial planning, you're saying, maybe? Yes. Something to watch. Yeah, I think, yeah, we, we created this index that kind of did a, a, a scan of, of what you went up and down in on your confidence. And we found that if you lived in a larger uh, city, you were more confident than, than if you lived in the country. If you did not have children, you were more confident than if you had children, because if you had children, again, what I, what I was just saying. And, um, you know, the list goes on. Intergenerational, there were differences. Um, also bet between lesbians, gay, bisexual, transgenders, there were differences in that. And I think that this decision kind of takes away a lot of that and, and hopefully um, helps people see that they can achieve their, their 
financial goals and achieve retirement like we all want to do. Very good. If you are just joining us, we're live from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. We're talking about the Supreme Court's decision to legalize same-sex marriage across the nation. I'm Linda topping Streitfeld with Josh Stoffregan, LGBT Project Lead for Prudential Financial, and Sarah Warbelow, Legal Director at the Human Rights Campaign. So let's move on to medical care. Um, we touched on it a little bit, but what are the big changes that this decision brings to medical care and health decision making for same-sex couples? Well, the most dramatic change is that a legally married same-sex couple will be able to make medical decisions for their spouse in the case of an emergency. Um, it's one of those items that many people didn't realize was an issue, um, and it's in that life or death moment when those benefits are most valuable. So we're talking about a, maybe a traumatic situation following an accident, or someone has a stroke, and the partner needs to make a decision about maintaining life support or whether to go into surgery, that kind of thing. That's right. Um, and even though there was uh, an, an order saying that any hospital that received Medicaid funding had to allow same-sex couples to visit their partner in the hospital, we know that the actual execution of that was a bit spotty. Mm -hmm. um, and having marriage as a right should help take care um, of some of those problems that people were encountering as well. Will there be any difference in terms of um, end of life decisions for people with long term or chronic illnesses? And of course, I'm thinking about ALS or cancer. Um, is there anything you should do differently now than before Friday? Well, if you have access to marriage, um, now, well, now that you have access to marriage, if you had, did not have it before and were not married, um, you know, if your partner is facing a long-term degenerative disease, um, you might want to consider getting married. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways in which um, you can help your spouse while they're in the midst of their illness, um, and certainly after they pass away, um, there are important benefits uh, to being able to take care of um, the bills that crop up and other things. Although, again, it's um, something that's best entered into with consulting a professional who can help navigate um, everything that's going on. Right. Makes sense. Can we, um, I, I want to go back and ask another a, a tax question that got skipped over a little bit, and that is, if I was married before, but my state didn't recognize my marriage, and now I go back and I say, you know what? Because my marriage wasn't recognized, I overpaid. Can you get a refund? Should yes. you ask for one? There's a three-year look-back period that the IRS mm -hmm. grants. Um, now, couples who are legally married, even prior to Friday, should already have been filing as married for the federal government. Um, but it's certainly possible that they were overpaying on their state income taxes and they should go to uh, their state income tax board um, and investigate what options are available for a refund. Um, a three-year look back is pretty standard. Okay, and, and also now they don't have to pay that accountant to do two separate returns under two separate filing systems, right? Because they can file the same way, both federal and state. That's right. Um, for a long time, couples were not only filing two returns, um, but as many as four because they had to create pretend state forms showing them as married um, that they could then submit along with their federal tax form to the federal uh, uh, IRS and then they had to do fake federal tax forms showing them as not married um, in order to accompany their state tax forms in, in some states. That was crazy. It was a real nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there are so many elements of this. And I realize, obviously, the U.S. Supreme Court decision doesn't have any force outside U.S. borders. Right. But just um, your own opinion, do you think that now with instant communications, with global media, is this going to have any impact outside the U.S.? Well, a lot of people look to the U.S. as a leader um, and are watching what we do with our own laws as they consider their own. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know, the United States was not at the 
front of the curve on marriage equality for same-sex couples. Uh, 24 countries uh, had marriage equality before the United States. Wow. Okay. I would just add that I agree that I think that we, we weren't the first, but it, it's now happened, and I think that the world is looking at us. And I think just an interesting touch point, too, about the, the sea change. I was reading something this morning about just as simple as on Facebook, people could color their profile photo uh, rainbow for the decision. And so more than 26 million people did that around the world. So it's very, very exciting mm -hmm. uh, momentum for the movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I saw that on Facebook. Yeah. Um, and it was amazing how the the whole page was just a rainbow of colors yeah. yes. and i know we have some um some images that reina has collected and i don't know if she's been showing them throughout this webinar but if not this would be a fine time to do it of some of the beautiful light displays that uh, popped up around the country and some of the other celebrations it's been a very exciting time it really has been, and those displays have really popped up in every corner of the country. Um, you know, this is not a celebration that's limited to one geographical area. It's really an American celebration. Are you surprised by the speed with which public opinion seems to have flip-flopped the la just the last few years? <laughs> uh, yes, I would say yes. I was, I was um, as I had mentioned earlier, we were at the kickoff to Pride in New York last week, and we were talking about how uh, Prudential had been doing it for 11 years. And 11 years ago, when we started doing this party on the pier, there uh, there weren't any states that allowed it. And, and then Massachusetts came, and in the course of 11 years, now we've gone from zero to 50. So I do think that it, it, it has accelerated, and I think that the, the rate in which is just very astounding and, and, and um, exciting at the same time. Mm -hmm. And part of what's really driven the change as well is that LGBT people are part of every community, um, of every faith, of every race, of every socioeconomic status. And that means that most Americans have a relative who's LGBT, a neighbor, a good friend, um, and that changes opinion really quickly as well. Is there anyone politically or otherwise who's going to continue to fight this, who's going to push for some nat national, for a constitutional change or um, to roll this back? Well, it's certainly likely that we will see bills introduced in Congress. We've already seen one, um, which uh, purports to address religious liberties, but really is not at the, the core of the bill. Um, that being said, there were efforts as far back as 2004 to amend the U.S. Constitution to bar same-sex couples from getting married. Um, and if that couldn't pass in 2004 with much less support for marriage equality than we have today, it's somewhat outrageous to think um, that it's possible to get it through Congress and then ratified uh, by a sufficient number of states. But, you know, there is um, uh, this pushback. We saw the attorney general of the state of Texas and the governor as well issue uh, advisory opinions um, and orders um, saying that government officials should be able to refuse to do their jobs um, just because they are uncomfortable with same-sex couples getting married. Um, it's really outrageous that uh, people whose paychecks come from the taxpayers uh, would abrogate their duties in that way. Um, but it, it is something that's going to be an ongoing conversation. Is there anything, anything else that reporters or the public generally needs to be thinking about as we move forward? Anything we haven't talked about that would be important for people to know or for journalists to be following uh, after this decision? Well, this past um, state legislative cycle, there's very few states that are, are still in session. Mm -hmm. um, we saw over 115 pieces of legislation that were attempts uh, to negatively impact the lives of LGBT people. Um, a good chunk, although not all of them, uh, were this false dichotomy between religion and sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, we anticipate that those are going to come back. Um, that's not the end of the line uh, for these efforts. Uh, despite the lessons learned in a place like Indiana, which um, the governor signed into law a Religious Freedom Restoration Act, um, which would have allowed for discrimination against LGBT people and women, um, arguably even racial minorities. 
um, the governor amended that particular bill, uh, signed in a new version, uh, and despite that, people are still bringing this type of, of legislation. The American public does not support it, but there's gonna be a few bad actors who are gonna continue to push these issues. Okay, so state legislatures are a place mm -hmm. we'll need to keep our eyes on. Yeah. Anything else, Josh? On the, on the finance side, we're finding that uh, financial advisors and other uh, individuals who are serving the community are, are just as confused as some of us are around what needs to be happening right now. So um, we're trying to create some more resources as well as other organizations like the Human Rights Campaign and others um, for financial advisors to be talking to the community and similar to what we did after Windsor in 2013, we're releasing a new white paper tomorrow that kind of goes through a checklist of what both individuals and couples should be looking at as they plan their finances, as well as what um, firms should be doing in terms of employee benefits. And so, um, just a quick plug, we also have the, um, which that wasn't a plug, right? Um, <laughs> we also have the author of the paper on LinkedIn today and tomorrow answering questions if anyone is interested um, to talk about specific LGBT finance. Okay. Very helpful. The other big issue is that um, the states and Congress are going to turn to advancing positive legislation for LGBT people as well, really trying to address uh, the types of discrimination that we're seeing. People forget that we are now have states where someone can get married in the morning, um, come back to the office, put their wedding picture on their desk and risk being fired. Right. Um, it's not true in every state. There are uh, 22 states that offer firm protections from discrimination, uh, but far too many where that is the reality that LGBT people face. Okay, something else to be watching. Mostly good news, but as always, uh, still a cautionary tale. I don't see any questions coming in from our viewers, so unless either of you has anything else, we will wrap it up. I want to thank both of you so much for being here, Josh Stoffregan of Prudential Financial and Sarah Warbelow of the Human Rights Campaign. Thanks to all of you for joining us here in the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation, where we are making good journalists better. Thank you. Thank you.